on this edition of Independent Sources 2013 in Review. Happy New Year, and welcome to a special edition of Independent Sources. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. This week, we look back on some of our favorite segments from 2013. We begin with a story we ran as the country marked the 12th anniversary of the September 11th attacks. Soon after the identities of the architects of the attacks were known, there was a groundswell of anti Muslim sentiment all over the U.S. An area in Midwood, Brooklyn, known as Little Pakistan, was particularly hard hit. Nearly 90% of Pakistani immigrants identified as Muslim, and many of them feared being swept up in the net of growing immigration rates in the neighborhood. Zafis LeBrun reported on the community's continuing struggle to trust law enforcement and recover economically after the raids. Uh, U.S. Immigration and Custom Enforcement which deals with uh, the deportation. They chartered planes to deport Pakistanis back home. Mohsen Zaire has very vivid memories of the fear that gripped his community in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks. Back then, he says his paper, Sada e Pakistan, was reporting on mass deportations nearly every week. Many people after 9-11, when the raids were being made, Many people uh, told me that they don't go to do grocery, they don't go to their work just because they could be stopped at any point <coughs> and <coughs> they could, be, they could uh, uh, get arrested and they could get deported. Hundreds were, and nearly a quarter of the estimated 50,000 Pakistanis living in the city, self-deported, moved to other states or to Canada. The impression was that raids are being made, people are being rounded up, people are fleeing away from little Pakistan or New York. So when something happened, it, the news spread like jungle, the fire of the jungle. This exodus eventually hit the community's pocket. Businesses closed and landlords that once had waiting lists to rent $3,500 a month rooms couldn't give space away. Years later, the community that once boasted that it was the biggest and most vibrant Pakistani enclave in the United States has not yet fully recovered. So this is the restaurant uh, whose ownership is changed for the third time in less than a year. Still, many in the neighborhood remain undaunted and are trying to reinvigorate the local economy and rehabilitate the image of Muslims in America. There is an organization which is called Pakistani American Community Club. They uh, started to celebrate the 4th of July as a festival. Every year the Pakistani American community celebrate Pakistan Independence Day. So this gentleman, uh, Mia Fayaz, he thought we should also uh, uh, celebrate the 4th of July. Zahir fears that those kinds of efforts are being undone by recent Associated Press reports that the New York City Police Department identified some city mosques as terrorist organizations. A slap in the face of a community whose majority populace is Muslim. On Coney Island Avenue, there are one, two, three, four, yeah. Four mosques are only from Avenue H to Beverly Avenue. So like in eight blocks. Within eight blocks, there are four mosques. Four mosques. What's worse, Zaire says, is the growing fear that members of the community are turning on each other. I notice there is a distrust between the community members. Now people look on each other, hey man, what are you, who are you working with, you know? They don't believe, sometimes they think, hey, this guy may be working for them. Despite those concerns, Zaire says the next generation of American-born Pakistanis will be more equipped to deal with such challenges. He thinks their comfort with English and the security of their immigration status will be the keys. Zaifas Lebrun, Independent Sources. 
We talk a lot about the significance and role of the ethnic media in their various communities on the show. That was very apparent during Hurricane Sandy. As the storm hit the East Coast, the ethnic media serve as a lifeline to their respective communities, providing translations of emergency bulletins and assistance after the storm. Abu Tahir, editor of Bangla Patrika, told us about his experience during the hurricane and how his commitment to the Bangladeshi community goes beyond journalism. If we talk about Sindhi, then it was in a very new experience of Bangladesh community because they never have that kind of experience in the U.S. Day was kind of dark. It was very gloomy and see, it's like anything comes any moment. So everybody was kind of ready to face any kind of situation. The phone started to ring, I think, from about 6 or 5 o'clock, 5 to 6 o'clock. Uh, everybody is calling. I, I think before even that what could happen, what we have to do. Many people, they want to know, you know, what is their obligation. Like any other New Yorker, Bangladeshis also, they are working class people. They take the train, they take the bus, and all of a sudden everything shut down uh, before Cindy came. So uh, it was kind of uh, very... Uh, 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 kind of very, uh, you know, scared moment for them. When uh, the city declared they're going to stay in the home, don't go out and all these things, they stay in the home. They watch TV um, and the other sorts of, of, of the information. But basically, many people, they don't understand what's going on and what could happen and what they're supposed to do. So then, uh, you know, we were in our office, we opened our office. Uh, even the whole day, whole night, uh, when Cindy happened, we was in our office. Uh, many people, they start to call us, um, you know, uh, do you know what uh, could happen, what we're supposed to do? So we provide whatever information we had, we provide the information. And I think it's helped a lot of people. Mayoral office, whatever they have, they could do, they are doing. But, you know, I mean, the community people, instead of three, calling 311, they, they feel better to call uh, uh, a newspaper office where they can get the information in their own language, where their countrymen is there, and they can get the specific in information they need. Beyond of the newspaper, uh, you know, um, rules, we play rules like, you know, uh, to spread out the spirit to the people that, okay, please help the people, because a lot of people, they are crying, they need help. It's not that just as a journalist will report it. This is the obligation as a a resident, this is the obligation as a human being to help the mankind. We'll do for our first break. When we come back, we celebrate a milestone with the city's seminal Spanish newspaper, and we hear how one community group is fighting to maintain affordable housing in Harlem. Thanks for staying tuned to a special year in review edition of Independent Sources. The grandfather of Spanish newspapers in the city turned 100 in October. El Diario La Prensa started as two separate competing papers, El Diario and La Prensa. They merged in 1963 to become one of the most influential papers in the city. We learn more about the publication's 100 years of advocacy in this report produced by Vianora Venka. In 1913, when La Prensa was founded, there were about 14,000 Hispanics, according to the census. And it's interesting because when we commissioned a piece, having someone look at what 1913 New York was like, what what the writer found is that it was it, there was already this this brimming Hispanic community. It wasn't something that was um, it was fledgling, but it was very vibrant, and there was a really huge cultural and art scene. And there has been throughout centuries a, a Hispanic presence in different eras, you know, of New York City's history. So this idea, um, I think that understanding that La Prensa was founded in 1913 by a vibrant community, mostly Spaniards at that time and other Latin Americans, many who had come for commercial reasons or to, to live in a different country or for political reasons, etc., had really um, bonded and established this paper to speak to them, to represent their interests and needs and to keep in touch with back home. And we still, to this day, uh, approaching 100 years later, remain faithful to that mission. El Diario chronicles some of the struggles that happened around education. A lot of people would be surprised to know that bilingual education was not mandatory uh, up until really the 70s when Hispanics pushed for a decree to be issued. So this idea that you would come here as an immigrant 
and automatically be placed into a dual language program or a bilingual uh, program, et cetera. You could basically, in back in the days, had to sink or swim. And that the institutionalization of the policies like that were chronicled uh, by El Diario, by La Prensa, and, and uh, Hispanics were really at the forefront of making sure that our kids and other communities were served by bilingual education. In comparison to other papers, and this rings true for uh, most ethnic and independent community media, people in our community, a large segment, use it to navigate the city. They're not just having philosophical debates about issues that may happen in other publications. They need El Diario to understand how government works here. We now function on a multi-platform way, multi, you know, in a digital way. We have our website, it gets updated real time. We have our social media outreach, we, we function much in the same way other operations function and we have to respond to the changes and to the different ways people receive information. Our new owners the, um, have a sort of know-how that they're bringing to the company. They've had great success with their newspaper in Argentina and it's really like other operations we're looking at what we can strategically do to sustain, to grow and to grow on other platforms. It has not affected our coverage. We continue to be, remain very vocal on a number of issues and like everybody else, we're trying, to, we're trying to figure out how to, you know, reconfigure ourselves in a way where we can serve our audience and build our audience and, and remain faithful to our mission. And at the same time, of course, have revenue to, to be able to sustain this, uh, this operation that's been around for 100 years and we anticipate 100 more. Another issue we tackled quite a lot last year was that of affordable housing. Some people argue that's a misnomer in New York City where rents are always skyrocketing. Part of our coverage included Judith Escalona's profile of Operation Fight Back. The grassroots organization has helped low-income families repair and purchase their homes since the 1980s. Since the 1980s, El Barrio's Operation Fight Back has been providing housing for low-income families in East Harlem. Gustavo Rosado, executive director, has been there from the beginning, when abandoned buildings and drugs were consuming the city. This one particular building had a drug dealer in it, and this drug dealer had occupied a commercial space and had leased it from the city of New York, and they were paying their rent. The commercial space was called In the Sauce Sandwich Shop, but it was only a front for selling drugs. The building's tenants took the drug dealer to housing court and lost. When we lost in court, we came back to the building and to conduct candlelight vigils in front of the building, and that movement was called Operation Fight Back, and that's how we got our name. The drug dealer was forced out, and the tenants were able to buy the building from the city through the Tenant Interim Lease Program. It allowed them to lease their apartments and eventually buy them for $250 each. As we organized more and more buildings, we realized that we needed to develop the capacity to manage buildings. Many of the buildings had tenants that weren't, uh, didn't have enough capacity to manage, keep financial records, submit reports to the city of New York, and we filled that role for them and gradually started managing property. By 2005, the organization was managing 36 buildings with over 400 low-income apartments they had renovated. <laughs> Daniel Dobson lives in one of those buildings with his wife and son. It's a pretty spacious apartment. It's very elegant, very nice. To me, Operation Fireback is uh, superior than, than, than the rest. You know, you can't compare because other places charging $1,300, $1,400 for slumlord type apartments. Slum apartments or not, high rents are now the norm in New York City. In East Harlem, there's been a wave of new construction by outside real estate investors interested in market rate housing. It really does bring to light some of the urgency that we have in trying to maintain the existing affordable housing market because as more private investors come in and develop 
market rate housing. It encourages others to come to the neighborhood. And then it puts more pressure on the low income community. So that's how we could gradually get squeezed out. So this is what normally happens. I'm so sorry. Ebony Middlebrooks was almost squeezed out along with her three children. She'd spent two years looking for an apartment when she got a call from an Operation Fight Back manager. She asked me to come and see it, and I was blown away. I walked in, and I remember thinking to myself, okay, it's gonna be like this one little room, because that's what I've seen in the past. You come in, and there's one little room, and then you walk in, and there's two rooms where only a bed can fit. And that's not what I got. What she got was a three-bedroom apartment with a foyer, dining area, and living room for $850 a month. When she told me that it, the rent goes based on your salary, I think I almost had a heart attack. Operation Fight Back not only rents apartments to families like the Dobsons and the Middlebrooks, they're also creating opportunities for modest income families in East Harlem to own their homes. We think that there are households that have two income families that could purchase a home or an apartment and we feel that's important to stabilizing our neighborhoods. Today Gus Rosado is as committed to Operation Fight Back's mission as he was on that first vigil 30 years ago. For him housing is not about investing in real estate it's about investing in families and neighborhoods. Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. Pop culture sometimes celebrates African-American women for being curvy or thick. However, there are alarming statistics that show that four out of five black women are bordering on obese. It's a disturbing trend that may have more to do with food access than bad eating habits. Abby Ishola filed this piece about Michaela Angela Davis. Davis has joined the growing ranks of black women who are studying programs around the country to battle the budge. So, okay, so then we've got the garlic popping, right? And I just put the greens right in. Michaela Angela Davis has made eating fresh and healthy food a part of her daily life. This will last my dope daughter and I halfway through the week. The 48-year-old also maintains a consistent exercise regimen. Two, eyes full. But she's not doing it alone. Last December, the image activist teamed up with her friends and started a workout campaign called 30 for 30. Her goal was to get black women moving. We launched this 30 for 30 and we encourage people to do 30 minutes of exercise or movement for 30 days, that's it. Even if you put on music and freestyle dance and you just move for 30 minutes, like feel who you are, feel your body again and we got you and we're connected. Then she began a healthy There's eating a mission it, called you know, Fresh Friday. Yeah. Fresh food, when you think about it, really is prettier. The challenge, eat only fresh and non-processed foods on Fridays. Davis and other participants use social media to attract black women around the country to the program. They share information on healthy meals and photos of their workouts using catchy hashtags like fit is fly and fresh is fly. She was moved to action when she learned a few alarming statistics. According to the Centers for Disease Control, African-American women have the highest obesity and diabetes rates compared to other groups in the U.S. In 2010, black women were 70 percent more likely to be obese than non-Hispanic white women. We're dying from preventable things. It's like we didn't survive the institution of slavery and Jim Crow and the civil rights movement to kill ourselves at dinner. Beyond the nutritious menus and workout sessions, she also enlisted the support of Peak Performance Gym in Manhattan to hold a series of seminars called What's Eating Black Women? What she's found is that even among African-American women from high income brackets, issues like depression and feelings of isolation at some neighborhood gyms play a major part in the health and fitness disparity. We found that there were re a lot of really practical reasons why some black women weren't working out. They didn't feel safe in certain spaces working out. That their bodies were so exoticized, like you go into one of these really elite gyms and you're the only super curvy girl in there that they've ever seen aside from Kim Kardashian and there's all this attention on you. So if we roll together, you know, if there's two or three or four of you, 
it creates a different story, right? A, it's fun. B, you have some protection. Davis says the response to her campaign has been overwhelming, but there have been some challenges. The food piece is a little bit harder, so we have to be much more consistent and a little bit more creative in how we present how to eat because we literally find people don't know. They really don't, they go in down the aisle of produce and don't know what to do. She plans to launch another month of 30 for 30 this spring. She's also in talks to get sponsorship to host a black girl boot camp. I think really what's missing is this sense of support and sisterhood and community and that we're not gonna leave you. Like this is, this is not gonna be just a moment. Like we wanna be fit and fly and fresh to death till the day we rest. Still to come on the show, a biracial drummer Bring some ethnic diversity to an ancient art form. Welcome back. Kai Yun is a dragon dancer who is putting a 21st century spin on an ancient art form, the lion and unicorn dance. I profile Yun for this show. <laughs> The Lion and Unicorn Dance. We see it every year during Chinese New Year celebrations. It's a centuries old tradition that dates back to China. The dance is usually performed at social events like weddings and Chinese New Year celebrations to bring prosperity and good luck to villagers. Uh, first off, you have to have great energy. The difference in the lion and the unicorn, the unicorn is more serpentine, very smooth and playful. The southern lion, specifically, is more fierce and has more uh, power involved in it. I feel that it's the, the essence, the spinal cord of the Chinese culture. And uh, for centuries and dynasties, it's been around and still continues to this day. Kayan is a member of the Moi Fa Lion and Unicorn Dance Team in Chinatown. His mother is Puerto Rican but he has followed in the footsteps of his Hong Kong-born father. He has been playing drums and dancing as long as he can remember. I feel like um, a lot of Asian Americans that are born here tend to become Americanized and lose their essence of their culture and maybe not so proud to be from Asian ethnicity. But me being of a mixed culture, I, I appreciate both. So I, I embody both of my cultures and, and like to spread the knowledge to everyone who's interested in learning. One person that Yun has been able to share his culture with is his childhood chum, James Akins, a Caribbean American from Flatbush, Brooklyn, who has embraced Chinese culture like his own. We're best friends, so, you know, I'm always at his house and he's always practicing. And, you know, just practice along and, you know, get into it. And, you know, just over years and years and years, you know, just keeping it up. At first, the duo was looked at suspiciously by local Chinese devotees who questioned their authenticity. But they've since dispelled those concerns. It's almost like the United Colors of Benetton, to be honest with you. <laughs> We're actually, I, 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 I can't say this factually, but just from what I've seen in Chinatown over the years of going down to Chinatown, I'm pretty sure that our group is, you know, one of the most diverse groups oh. in Chinatown. And that also says a lot. You know, when you can take someone that's not from your direct cultural background and actually make this a part of their culture. Yun and Akins, both in their early 30s, have contributed to the team's diversity in more ways than one. They've also been able to create a fusion of the traditional lion and unicorn dance with hip hop that they've displayed at venues like Webster Hall and some local colleges. So we did first some of the martial arts, some of the lion dance, and some of the hip hop dance. So the youth would get involved. They see something new, like every day they see hip hop videos on MTV, whatever channel. And uh, now they see this new thing they've never seen before. They think it's a dragon dance. And they're like, oh, what's that? Oh, it's, it's cool. And, you know, the drums are loud, the music's loud, and it's very vibrant, very exciting and energetic. So we kind of like, uh, expand to a new generation, a new genre of music, as well as culture and dance. Yeah. 
And finally, despite the morbid name, the Day of the Dead is about connecting Mexicans with their deceased loved ones. It's also about celebrating life and poking fun at the living. Food is an important component, and it begins with a simple type of bread. Sarah Pizon told us more in this report. Here in Sunset Park, Braulio Contla has been baking hojaldas, monas, and rosquetes for more than seven years. These are like unas canillitas de, de muerto, más o menos. Se significa el un, un muerto. Un muerto así. Ah, sí. Ajá. Cruzado de brazos. Their traditional pan de muerto, a special bread eaten on the Days of the Dead. They're part of an important Mexican holiday celebrated on the 1st and 2nd of November. It's meant to commemorate loved ones that have passed. Throughout the month of October, Contla and his five bakers make about 1,500 of these per day. The huevo, nuez, canela. Mm -hmm. The breads are part of a ritual that dates back to the 12th century. The holiday puts a Mexican twist on a Catholic celebration. It combines All Saints Day and All Souls Day with pre-Columbian period rituals for the dead. Typically, this was the time of the year when people return, and still is the time of the year when people return to their hometown. And they return to their hometown, and the altar of their dead connects them to their family, to their town. So it's always been powerful for migrants, and sometimes a little sad for migrants when they can't go back. There's a feeling of longing uh, for, your, for your people that comes on these days. Claudio Lomnitz wrote a book about Mexicans and their relationship with death. He was born in Chile, but grew up in Mexico. He adopted the ritual early on. Every year, he places multiple pan de muertos on his altar. This celebration can get a bit pricey. Some families save all year just to buy what's needed for their altar. Because according to the tradition, these elements are crucial to bringing back their loved ones, and there's only a small window to do so. Our family, they have one day to return their souls to the earth. We cannot see them, um, but we believe that they can see us. So we start to prepare the altars here. You offer them uh, food and water, typically, as well as uh, um, copal, uh, traditionally, which is a, 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 a tree sap that is used as an incense that helps communicate what happens in this world with the other world. Um, so you attract the souls with the smell of the incense and with these flowers, the kind that we have here, the Simpasuchi flowers, and then you, you feed them, you regale them. You regale them with food and drinks they used to enjoy, but it's not all about the bread and the beer. Here at Don Paco Lopez Panaderia in Sunset Park, they've been making pan de muerto for three generations, but they're also selling calaveras de azúcar, sugar skulls, meant to commemorate the dead on El Dia de los Muertos. It's also something that they cannot miss in the altar because we have to see the, the life the way it is. You mm -hmm. have to, to celebrate this. And what, what, what else to, to have a sugar, a piece of uh, sugar to right. sweet your life? The sugar skulls and skeletons, or catrinas, are part of a more political part of the holiday. It's believed the souls of the dead witness humanity's collective mistakes and come back to criticize the living. In the 19th century, they used it to lampoon politicians, for example, to criticize the rich, things like that. In the 20th century, and even to today, we have a lot of Days of the Dead to criticize, for example, U.S. immigration policy. The political criticism may change throughout the years, but the ritual and its significance remain the ultimate representation of Mexicans' complicated relationship with death. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned to our 2013 and review special. See you next week for more independent sources.